This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I wanna to talk about Bitcoin dominance and what's called the flippening. And the flippening would be when another cryptocurrency gets a larger market cap than Bitcoin. And people are always talking about when is Ethereum going to flip Bitcoin. This is what came up after I made yesterday's video in which I demonstrated that Ethereum is clearly a security, should be regulated by the SEC, and Gary Gensler knows this. And a lot of people attributed interesting psychological motivations to me and implied that I was very worried about how quickly ETH was growing. Uh, ETH will eventually take over BTC. Sorry to BTC investors was one comment on that video. Another one was funny how these videos come out when ETH is growing faster than BTC. Worried about being flipped, maybe. And I, this is a topic I've been meaning to cover for a while and really do it in depth. When you see these comments, at least when I see these comments, I immediately know that the person has not done a deep dive and doesn't know what they're talking about. It sounds like these are very strong allegations and uh, that Bitcoin is in trouble, but let's investigate this a little bit more and you can decide for yourself. Here's a chart of Bitcoin dominance and we can see that it's been going off a cliff really since the beginning of the bull market in April, I'm sorry, in May of 2020 when it was closer to call it 60, 68, 70%. Today it's closer to 40, 41%. Now what is Bitcoin dominance? The way you calculate it is you basically take the market cap of Bitcoin, you multiply the price by all the coins that have been mined, that gets you the market cap. This is a metric, of course, it's borrowed from, from stocks. It's a little bit of a strange metric for crypto. Nevertheless, market cap of Bitcoin divided by the market cap of all the cryptos in the crypto universe, including BTC itself. And then you just convert it to a percentage. And then this tells you what percentage of the total crypto market cap is owned or what market share Bitcoin has. Obviously, when Bitcoin first came out, we could say that it basically had 100% market dominance. It was really the only thing of its kind. There had been experiments before Bitcoin, various e-cash crypto experiments, but none of them had ever really succeeded. So when Satoshi mined the Genesis block, Bitcoin, we could say, had 100% market dominance, even though it didn't even have a price at that point. Uh, today, though, it's as we said, it's closer to 40%. And so this leads a lot of people to conclude that Bitcoin is losing market share. It's losing dominance because it's old tech, because it's boomer coin, because it's slow, it can only spit out a block every 10 minutes, etc. This is a metric that's always cited, or it's usually cited by people who want to push their coin on you instead. What I'm going to argue in this video is that it may not even be a relevant metric when you really put in the time to understand these things. If you want to see the current Bitcoin dominance numbers, you can go to CoinMarketCap. At the top, they have the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies that they cover, which is at this point is 15,380. And uh, this, of course, includes Bitcoin's market cap as well. And then you have Bitcoin's market cap down here. You can divide this one thing into the other and you end up with uh, Bitcoin dominance, which would be around 40%, ETH dominance, which is around 22%. What's really interesting about this though, is if you do this over a period of time, you will see that the top contenders here, and again, it's the first, it's really uh, the first 10 or so, maybe 10 or 20 cryptocurrencies on this list that provide the bulk of the market cap. If you scroll down to 14,000 something, these are tiny, tiny market caps that don't contribute to the denominator in that Bitcoin dominance calculation. So I'm going to make this very simple. You can apply my analysis to all 15,000 if you want. But what I'm going to do is demonstrate that even if we look here, uh, this is today's, uh, based on today's cryptocurrency prices, if we look at the top 10 names here, and then we compare them to the top 10 names even uh, four years ago. So call it, uh, this is December 8th, 2017. We can see that these names are constantly changing over time. The only really uh, consistent names that I see, obviously Bitcoin is always at the head of the list. We have Ethereum in number two, and then uh, it would appear that XRP is somewhere on the list. So many of these names have dropped below the top 10, Bitcoin Cash, IOTA, Litecoin, um, even Monero, etc. And so this is one thing when people say Bitcoin is losing market share. The funny thing about this, it's always losing market share to different cryptocurrencies. And this list, this top 10 list is constantly changing. So that'd be the first point that I make. Obviously, Ethereum seems to be always nipping 
at the heels of Bitcoin. This is one reason I've spent so much time discussing Ethereum on this channel, and that's why I made the video about Ethereum being a security. But other than Ethereum, we really see not a lot of um, not a lot of similarities between these two lists of the top 10 cryptocurrencies by market cap. So that would be the first point. Before I go on to the second point, I just ask you, if you're finding this video helpful so far to be, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. I'm finding that there are a lot of people watching my videos who are not subscribers. This is one of the metrics that YouTube allows you to see at an aggregate level. So if you if you enjoy my videos, if you watch them on a daily or weekly basis, basis please, please do subscribe and share these videos because it really helps the channel. Okay, so let's go back to this top 10 list. Obviously, Bitcoin at the top, but we have some strange coins in here when you think about it. People take it for granted when calculating Bitcoin dominance. We have Tether right here, and then we have USDC. Now, these are both what are called stable coins or US dollar stable coins, and they're basically pegged to the dollar. They're, they may or may not be completely collateralized. In other words, the, the centralized issuing facilities and companies that issue these may or may not have enough dollars to cover them. I would say that doesn't matter for the, for the purposes of this argument. The, the bigger problem is counting these in Bitcoin dominance. These are stable coins pegged to the dollar that are literally engineered to lose 10 to 20% purchasing power every year because that's what the dollar has been losing in recent years. So these are not, uh, I would not say I'm worried about USDC and USDT displacing Bitcoin. The whole point of Bitcoin is to get away from fiat currencies. U.S. dollar is probably the best of the bunch, the U.S. dollar, the Swiss franc, but it's still absolutely terrible. And imagine storing your wealth in something that loses 10 to 20 percent purchasing power every year. The other problem with USDC and USDT, of course, is that they're eventually going to be replaced by central bank digital currencies, by a crypto version of the U.S. dollar that's completely controlled by the Fed. So they're not even going to be around uh, forever. That being said, feel free to use them if you want. But what I'm arguing here is that they really should not be counted when calculating Bitcoin dominance. They're not a threat to Bitcoin. The U.S. dollar is not a threat to Bitcoin. Next thing I would say about this list is that many of these cryptocurrencies, I'm going to pick on XRP, are not that liquid. If you try to dump any significant amount, you will move the market sharply lower, even among the top 10 names here. And XRP is one that's notoriously illiquid, in part because it's been delisted in, uh, in so, from so many exchanges, uh, especially in the US. So I would say that some of these market caps, XRP in particular, are actually quite fake. And they're a lot like a recent IPO market cap in the stock market before the six month lockup expires. So what you have in that situation is the stock can trade up. There's a supply shortage. There's a squeeze when it first comes public. And then what happens is there's all this this uh, this supply on the sidelines that then comes out and dumps on the market. We've seen this happen to many, many IPOs over the last uh, six months or so. And so when you're going to determine the market cap of something, you need to have a free floating market. And if there's a giant um, if there's a giant uh, unlock coming that's going to tank it, you need to take that into uh, into consideration as well as as well as all these liquidity considerations. Ripple, the company, still owns holds the vast majority of XRP tokens, and these are going to be slowly dumped into the market. This is the main way that Ripple, as a company, makes money. This is why the SEC is suing them. Hopefully, they can put these people in jail before they end up dumping the remainder of their XRP on the very naive retail buyers, the XRP army, who for some reason loves this token. By contrast, when you contrast Bitcoin and its liquidity to something like Ripple, just to something like XRP, Bitcoin is the deepest, it's the most liquid crypto market in the world. Its price discovery is real. When you say that XRP has a market cap of 38 billion, this is not at all, um, this is not at all sustainable it'd be very easy to move this market cap 10, 20, 30% in either direction just by selling, uh, putting a large, large order in. So you talk about Bitcoin whale price manipulation, which I, I don't really think is a thing. By contrast, these other much more illiquid currencies, cryptocurrencies have a much bigger problem. Bitcoin has, uh, it, it, it's very volatile, it moves around, but I would suggest that its price discovery is 
real. You can sell a billion dollars and make the market go up, uh, make the market crash down temporarily, but then to get back in, you have to buy a billion dollars and that will make the market go back up. I think people overestimate the power of whales. Here's what fake price discovery looks like, and here's how I could completely mess up coin market cap. I could print up, let's say I decide to do my own coin, which I would never do. Uh, I could print up three trillion, just to pick a, a random number, three tri trillion of this new cryptocurrency that I'm going to call Crater Coin. I could print up three trillion of them, and I could sell just one of them or two of them for a dollar. At that point, the market cap of Crater Coin would be three trillion. You take one dollar times three trillion, that's the market cap. At that point, uh, Crater Coin would have a much larger market cap than either Bitcoin or Ethereum. It would flip in everything, and as a result of Crater Coin, Bitcoin dominance would plummet. And this might be great for my marketing department if I had one, uh, but this would not suggest that Bitcoin is under threat at all. And what we should say is that most of these 15,000 cryptos are just like Crater Coin. If you scroll down and, and look at them, they, they barely trade at all. They're highly illiquid. And so they really shouldn't even be. Um, it's, a, it's a misleading metric to include them in the Bitcoin dominance uh, calculation. Then we have the category. If we if we look at these names, we could we could include a lot of them under the category of Ethereum killers, uh, cryptos that are trying to displace or flip in or flip Ethereum. We have BNB, Solana, uh, Dot, Luna, etc. And these the pitch here, of course, is always it's feast it's faster and cheaper, lower fees than the Ethereum network, which has really suffered from congestion and sky high gas fees. So you can see why these exist. Uh, and they are slowly taking market share from Ethereum. When people say that Bitcoin's about to get flipped by Ethereum, what I often say is that it's, it's much more likely that one of these coins is going to flip Ethereum first, which would be the ultimate irony. And not that it would really, really matter, but all of these Ethereum killers, they take a trade-off. They're much more centralized. And when you hear someone say that their coin is better than your coin, there's always trade-offs involved. There's always engineering and design trade-offs involved. And these are often and should be conscious decisions. So just saying that something is faster, you know, Venmo, Visa, these are very fast systems as well. But this is what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to get away from centralized control. But these companies have been very, very smart. Solana has been very smart. Uh, they've come up with a, a much faster system. It, it crashes occasionally. They have to take it online and do a manual reboot. It's not decentralized at all, though. It's highly centralized. And they. one of the things, I, I should make a video about this, but I just came across it looking through the Solana documentation. Solana is even now using manual slashing uh, because they're on a proof of stake system. It provides such weak security. So they have to go through and manually do it. So it, this is not even a system that runs on its own. I, I'll make a video about slashing uh, soon. What I often hear when I talk about how these Ethereum killers are so centralized, or even, even Ethereum is fairly centralized, uh, a lot of people in the comments will say, well, most people don't care about centralization. And of course, that's true today, but it's very short-sighted. And it's a huge departure from Satoshi's vision, um, meaning BTC, Bitcoin, the reason that we're all here. Centralization doesn't matter at a point in history right now when you have a relatively benign regulatory regime. Now, I think I think a lot of regulation is coming and it is about to soon matter, as I argued in yesterday's video about Ethereum being a security. But centralization is your Achilles heel when the regulators, when the politicians, when the central bankers come after you to shut you down. And the current financial system, let's be frank, it's not just gonna sit back and let the US dollar or the euro get displaced by Bitcoin. There's gonna be a big fight and all these centralized protocols don't stand a chance. They don't stand a chance. They're centralized and as such, they're really fast. But the centralization is a huge Achilles heel. As I've said many times, you can make two phone calls. You could call up AWS, Amazon Web Services, which went down yesterday. And you could also call up Infura and doing this, you could shut down the vast majority of the Ethereum network at this point because they run on these centralized services. That's another reason Ethereum is such a, a joke. And if you if you went to Amazon headquarters or if you went to AWS headquarters, you went to Infura 
and you went there with a small army or a small uh, government force and told them to turn various things off, they could turn off Ethereum in its current incarnation. A lot of people won't uh, tell you that. So another problem with this top, these top 10 cryptocurrencies that are used to, ca to calculate Bitcoin dominance, almost all of them had large pre-mines or pre-sales, Ethereum, XRP, Cardano, Solana, just to name a few. I'll show this uh, initial target, initial token allocation chart again, where the red shows insiders and their initial uh, tokens that they were given or that they bought at very low prices. This includes the development team, the company, and VC purchase tokens. Of course, when you have a company, that just that gives that gives away the secret that this is a high, these are highly centralized, uh, highly centralized protocols and development projects. Solana is one of the biggest offenders, having 48% uh, uh, DOT, 33%, Binance, 50%, etc. And so this is, this, is, this is the initial state of these projects. And the initial state matters. When you have VCs at the helm, things become very different. If you don't believe that, you can watch my recent video about Solana billionaires laughing, uh, Solana billionaire venture capitalists, VCs laughing about how they're going to dump their Solana on retail investors. This is very real. And as Warren Buffett would say, if you're playing poker and you don't know who the sucker is at the table, the sucker is probably you. This is a great description, I think, of the the uh, the altcoin space as well. It's if you have a pre-sale, if you have a huge pre-mine, if you, you, you start your company, your cryptocurrency, your new global currency using venture capitalists, it's impossible to end up with a new neutral global reserve asset or new reserve currency when you start off with a large allocation to insiders and VCs. Bitcoin, as I say many times, had an immaculate conception. It started in a very special way and the founder left the project very early on and left the steering of the project to, to the community at large. It's very different when you have very large insiders and you have VCs. Again, you might talk about Bitcoin whales or OGs who hold huge amounts of Bitcoin. They have no influence whatsoever on the development or protocol. Bitcoin is very different this way. It leads by soft forks, which are backwards compatible, whereas something like Ethereum, it leads by hard forks. And um, the developers in that case are really in charge in Ethereum because they can just hard fork you away from your coins. Now, you can call a new cryptocurrency like Solana, you can call it neutral, but it's not. And one of the ways this has played out, of course, in, in Ethereum is insiders have a huge influence over future monetary policy. No one knows the future monetary policy of Ethereum, but we do know that some very large insiders will be the ones who decide it, people like Vitalik Buterin. When you have a large allocation to insiders at launch, when you have a pre-mine, what happens is then the history of that coin evolves to further enrich original holders. So ETH moving to proof of stake away from proof of work. They pretend they're doing this for environmental concerns, for ESG concerns. But I think the real reason is because you have all these original whales who will now get to make even more money by staking their pre-mined coins. So they got these coins basically for free and now they get to stake them and enrich themselves further. And the thing about proof of stake, you don't have to do any work. It's not a proof of work system. You don't have to, um, you don't have to stay on top of things, have the fastest ASICs, have the lowest cost of electricity. You can basically just start off rich, sit on your hands and get much, much richer. And you begin to own an increasingly large percentage of the supply. Ethereum moving to proof of stake just recreates the current fiat financial system where few people control the system, determine the uh, future development and determine the future monetary policy. So if you like Ethereum, it means you just want to substitute Vitalik Buterin for Jerome Powell. I would agree that that is an improvement, but Jerome Powell is is so low uh, is so low that it's hard to um, it's 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 quite easy to come up with a better uh, replacement for him. That being said, I don't want Vitalik Buterin, the man boy with a cat purse. I don't want him in charge of the new global reserve. Uh, asset or global reserve currency. I just don't think that's going to work very well. But let's assume that it happens. Let's assume that Ethereum eventually wins and flippens Bitcoin. Bitcoin basically goes away. It keeps trading. Maybe it's just dead in the water like XRP, um, but it's basically gone away. 
Ethereum has won. So what will, we, what will we be left with at that point? We'll just be left with central bank digital currencies, spy coins, surveillance coins issued by the Fed, where they track all your spending and all of your earning. And then we'll have Ethereum controlled by insiders, controlled by Vitalik Buterin and the folks at Consensus, et cetera, and other large companies uh, like Infura. Is, is this really what Ethereans want? Is this what the revolution is about? Is this really a victory to be celebrated? This happens, as I said, we'll just end up with another iteration of the current financial system. And then maybe Ethereum flips Bitcoin, and then Fedcoin, which is the CBDC, comes out and flips Ethereum. Would that be something to celebrate just because Fedcoin then has a larger market cap than Ethereum? Fedcoin will still lose 10 to 20% or more of its purchasing power every year. Fedcoin will monitor you. Fedcoin will take taxes, harvest taxes automatically out of your uh, out of your wallet. This is not something to celebrate. And let's face it, ETH, Ethereum is not up to the job of defeating central banking and separating money and state. This is why I'm here. This is the main reason I'm here. I think we'll all make a, a huge amount of, uh, of money and increase our purchasing power in the process. But this is really why I'm here. I wanna separate money from state. There's no reason the two have to go together. There's no reason a bunch of oligarchs and insiders can print up a, a little, uh, can control the money printer and dilute the, uh, the fruits of your labor and basically steal your money out of your pocket through money printing and inflation. I want these central bankers defeated. I want a permanent separation between money and state so that humanity can focus on other things and not be on this perpetual, um, this perpetual uh, wheel. Only Bitcoin has a chance of unseating the current system and destroying the certain current system. And so I'd be very frank here. Anyone who fights Bitcoin and promote, promotes altcoins, and Vitalik Buterin certainly has a long history of bad-mouthing Bitcoin. And it's funny that all of these people, they make a living basically by saying how they're better than Bitcoin or just bad-mouthing Bitcoin. But anyone who fights Bitcoin and promotes these other centralized projects is really hurting our chances of escaping from the current mess. This is why I, have to, I go after Ethereum. This is why I go after XRP. It's not because they're personal threats to me. I could have, um, it, this is not what I'm in it for. It's because I want to see an escape from the system. And I want my children and grandchildren to not live in the world of central banking. It's important to point out Bitcoin maximalists, in my experience, apart from the way they're, they're portrayed by Ethereans, for example, are usually not narrow-minded fools. Rather, they're people who put in hundreds or thousands of hours of research and truly understand the lay of the land and the, the landscape of the cryptocurrencies right now. Whenever someone cites Bitcoin dominance, I immediately know that they have not put in this time and done the work and thought through these, these issues. And they're, they're basically just parroting what they've heard from people who want to sell their tokens and their cryptos to them. It's okay, most of these people mean well, which is why I'm making this video, but you have to understand that this industry uh, is completely full of snakes and cockroaches. Of course, the traditional fiat financial system uh, is, is quite awful as well. People like Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen and Christine Lagarde, who's actually a criminal who should be in jail. But the cryptocurrency industry, especially when you involve pre-mines and proof of stake, it devolves to the same nasty system. And this is why it's, uh, I put in so much time making these videos. I want people to understand what's actually going on here. And I want them to set themselves up and their families up for the transition that's taking place. And if you're focusing all your time on dog coins or XRP or something like this or, or NFTs, there's something seriously wrong with your head. And it's not your fault. You've been, um, you've been propagandized by these people who want to dump their NFTs and their tokens on you. But if you don't put in the time to truly understand Bitcoin, you're not going to make it. You're not going to be able to hold it. You're not going to want to buy it. And once you buy it, you're going to get wiggled out by some 40 or 50% drawdown, which means nothing, which is just normal volatility. And the reasons, of course, for Bitcoin's volatility as well. It's not an engineered currency. It's a free market. And this is um, when we see volatility in Bitcoin, we should rejoice because what it is, it's, it's, it has a very inelastic supply. It doesn't matter how much demand there is for it. There's a very limited supply. So this volatility 
uh, is the same result of having a maximum supply of 21 million coins, which is what makes it all worth it and gives Bitcoin its scarcity and will give, give Bitcoin eventually its very high market cap, probably above 100 trillion for all of Bitcoin. If you don't put in the time to truly understand Bitcoin, though, and you just cite Bitcoin dominance and flippening and uh, speed and three, throughput and all these issues, you're not going to understand Bitcoin and you're not going to make it. You can't just read one article in the newspaper and then come and have all these opinions about Bitcoin. This was just like the people on the Internet in the early in the early 90s or mid 90s, people like Paul Krugman, who said that the uh, Internet would have no greater impact on the world than the fax machine. There were a lot of people who applied previous mental models to the Internet. They said Amazon was a bubble. They said Google was a bubble. They said Facebook was a bubble. They said Apple was a bubble. And they didn't know what they were talking about because they were asking the wrong questions. Here's a, uh, an interesting Bitcoin dominance index. This is, this is a little questionable in, on its own, but I think it's, it's probably a better way of looking at it. It's called the Real Bitcoin Dominance Index. And what it does is it excludes stable coins for reasons that we've mentioned. It gets rid of all coins that had an ICO or any other sort of centralization. And then it only includes proof of work coins. Proof of work is the only way you can have real money. You can't have proof of stake. And I've talked about that in other videos. Perhaps I should make another video. But so the only the only other currencies that are calculated in this market, in this Bitcoin market dominance index, are these proof of work currencies. And we can see there are a lot of them here. BSV, complete joke. Um, the uh, creator of that, who you may have heard about in the news, if he were Satoshi, uh, he should be able to move his original Bitcoin around. He can't. He has to rely on the legal system instead. Uh, Bitcoin Cash, BSV, these are all failed forks that have massively lost uh, hash rate. They've been subject to 51% attacks, and their market caps are just a tiny fraction of where Bitcoin is. Uh, Monero, I would say, was the most interesting of this bunch for its privacy purposes. I don't think it ultimately accrues value, though it could be a useful tool to use along with Bitcoin when you want to spend Bitcoin. And we have these coins we've never heard of, Bitcoin Gold. Uh, Ethereum Classic was the original version of Ethereum that didn't go along with the uh, the DAO rollback, etc. So here's one way to calculate. And then, of course, Ethereum is in this index. Ethereum will drop out of this index when it moves to proof of stake. So this, this might be a more realistic version of Bitcoin uh, dominance when you look at it in this way. That being said, when you look at the individual names in here, there's nothing in here that can compare to BTC. Uh, when, once you put in the research. Final thoughts. Bitcoin dominance also typically falls in bull markets and then rises in bear markets. This has been a pattern, even if you accept Bitcoin dominance, which I don't think you should for the reasons I've talked about. We can scroll back here and see from the in the in the, the depths of the uh, bear market in 2018, Bitcoin dominance was like at 36%. It went back above 72% in the bear market in the crypto winter. And then, of course, it has plummeted since May of 2020 in the crypto bull market. It's funny, of course, what do we mean by crypto bull and bear markets? Well, they're always kicked off by the Bitcoin halving and the subsequent uh, four-year cycle. This is the other irony. Bitcoin, everyone defines themselves relative to Bitcoin. And even the crypto, crypto spring, summer, fall, winter cycle is based on Bitcoin halvings, which is uh, really tells you what the real driver is in the space. But Bitcoin dominance typically falls in bull markets and rises again in bear markets. This is what we'll see during the next crypto winter. At the same time, as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, that list of altcoin competitors changes over time while Bitcoin remains the same. Bitcoin has the largest market cap, deepest liquidity, most institutional interest, has that first mover advantage, the Lindy effect working for it, unchangeable properties, which include a credible long-term monetary policy that's built into the protocol that's not decided by someone like Vitalik. By contrast, alts like Ethereum, they're constantly changing their marketing, their use case, as well as their monetary policy. Bitcoin also is the only cryptocurrency that had a fair launch that doesn't have the founder still present and that is not centralized. Further, its function as a store of value, this really is the biggest category in the digital age, and Bitcoin is poised to win this category. I often see people say, well, Bitcoin's the best store of value, but XYZ coin is better for this and that. Uh, 
useful. Things do not necessarily have a larger market cap. For example, aluminum is a much more useful metal than gold, but it's a much cheaper metal in spite of that, simply because it's a bad store of value. It's a very common, it's a very common metal. Store of value really is, this is the ultimate use case for cryptocurrency, and this is where the huge market share is going to be. It's the largest category in the universe, simply because all present wealth and all future wealth, or a huge percentage of it, will eventually find its way into Bitcoin as the hardest money that's ever been created. Bitcoin dominance and the flippening, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is if you ask the wrong questions, and especially if you if you let altcoin promoters or someone like Vitalik tell you uh, tell you which questions to ask, this is the classic sales technique where you ask the right questions that will get the answer that gets them to buy your product. With Bitcoin, if you ask the wrong questions, you will end up with answers that will not provide good guideposts for what is coming. Bitcoin dominance is basically a meaningless metric the way it's currently calculated. Bitcoin dominance, if you want to understand Bitcoin dominance, you look at the max, uh, the maximum supply cap, you look at the decentralization, you look at the anti-fragility anti and the robustness of this apex predators of money, and you know what's coming. You don't need to look at a silly Bitcoin dominance chart. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.